Hello and welcome to our WJE webinar. My name is Liz Kemper and I'll be your moderator today. Our topic for this webinar is benefits and provisions of the new OSHA rule, Is Your Building Compliant? During the next hour, we will hear about the benefits and provisions of OSHA's final rule on locking working surfaces and personal fall protection systems now in effect. Yarko Simonen and Cal Bierman will summarize critical portions of the new rule and give an overview of local code provisions governing facade access, methods and equipment, and responsibilities of building owners and managers. Now I'll turn it over to Cal Bierman to get started. Thanks, Liz. Welcome everyone to the webinar covering the latest changes to OSHA fall protection rules. Along with Yarko Simonen, we hope to give you an idea of how the recent changes to OSHA's rules will impact your buildings and the activities you undertake involving exposure to falls. In the webinar, we will summarize critical portions of the new rule and give an overview of facade access methods and equipment, relevant code provisions governing facade access, and responsibilities of building owners and managers. To start, we'll get right into an overview of what OSHA changed. A new rule was published almost a year and a half ago on November 18th, 2016. This rule took effect on January 17th, 2017. The new rule updates and in some cases completely replaces OSHA provisions for work performed at heights. These are provisions for work performed in general industry, not construction. This generally means maintenance activities at your building and not construction projects. Construction requirements remain essentially unchanged with the latest rule update. Some of the requirements taking effect have delayed timeframes to implement, while others were effective at the time of the new rule. Some of the timeframes have further been modified after the original ruling. The new rules place more responsibilities on owners and by extension on contractors for compliance of OSHA regulations for fall protection of workers. There are additional regulations, training requirements, and equipment requirements that came into effect that won't be covered today for the sake of time. Here's a listing of some of the OSHA regulations that have changed or been replaced as part of the new rule change. The specific requirements and methods for compliance have both been updated. The figure compares the old OSHA sections in subpart D on the right to the now current configuration on the left. The changes are somewhat significant. They cover both the requirements or what an employer or worker is supposed to do as well as the methods or how said employer or worker is supposed to comply with the standards. So why the change and why now? There are several primary reasons for the rule change. First, and most importantly, OSHA wants to reduce injuries from falls greater than four feet. Second, the changes are intended to better align the general industry standards, which are typically maintenance activities with the construction standards. Also, OSHA would like to allow owners and employers more options when considering ways to comply with fall protection standards. Rulemaking and public hearings occurred several years ago, and OSHA made it apparent over the past couple decades that it, it intended to update the provision. Now I'll transition into some specifics for the requirements of work performed on low sloped roofs. A low sloped roof has a relatively flat roof with a slope less than four and 12. The height of the roof does not matter when categorizing the roof as a low sloped roof. Warehouses in the Kent Valley to high rises in downtown Seattle and Portland can all have low slope roofs. The old regulations were harsh and ambiguous. This presented difficulties when trying to comply with the requirements. The new regulations are for maintenance and align much better with OSHA's construction provisions. The regulations divide the roof into zones based upon the risk of falling. The distance from an unprotected edge is how the zones are identified. An unprotected edge can occur both at the perimeter of the roof and at any interior opening that someone can fall through. OSHA describes three zones with different levels of fall protection required in each zone. Zone one is for distances greater than 15 feet from an unprotected edge. 
Zone two is less than 15 feet, but greater than six feet. And zone three is less than six feet from an unprotected edge. Ocean does not refer to the zones as one, two, and three. This naming convention is included in the talk today for simplicity when discussing the different zones. There are some narrow exceptions for pre and post work inspections. Inspections are observations that are performed either before or after the actual work task is completed. For example, if a building maintenance worker is approaching the edge of a roof to see if a gutter is clogged, fall protection may not be required. But OSHA now says that if there is fall protection nearby and reasonably available, then that worker has to use it, regardless of how quick or temporary a task is to complete. Another example is an insurance agent inspecting the roof, the edge of the roof for wind damage when evaluating a claim. If there is no fall protection provided on the roof in terms of an anchorage point or a guardrail, the agent is allowed to make the inspection without using fall protection. If fall protection is available, the insurance agent is required to use it. The next few slides will provide an outline of what the fall protection requirements in each zone are. Zone one is for distances greater than 15 feet from unprotected edges. The green area on the image generally represents zone one. If work is being performed in the area, you can always provide full conventional forms of fall protection. However, OSHA does provide flexibility in this zone, realizing the risk of falling is relatively low. A warning line at no less than 15 feet from the edge can be provided at the perimeter of zone one. No fall protection is required for infrequent and temporary work if workers are prohibited from the 15 foot perimeter. Infrequent work is not explicitly defined, but examples in the rulemaking include tasks that are done on a monthly or annual basis. Temporary work is likewise described in the rulemaking as short duration perhaps an hour or two. Some examples include HVA filter replacement, satellite dish adjustment, seat, sealing a skylight joint, or unclogging a roof drain. Moving a little closer to the unprotected roof edge, zone two is less than 15 feet, but greater than six feet from the edge. The yellow area on the image generally represents zone two. Again, you can always provide full conventional forms of fall protection. For the same types of temporary and infrequent work, some sort of protection is required. In lieu of full fall protection, a designated area demarcated by a warning line can be employed for temporary and infrequent work. Warning line systems have specific requirements, not simply flagging or ropes. Full fall protection is required if the task is routine, meaning it's done on a regular basis or long-term work. As you get to zone three, where the distance is less than six feet, full fall protection is required. Types of fall protection that can be used are listed on the slot. The previously mentioned exceptions for pre or post work inspection can be used, but if the means for fall protection are provided, they must be used. Let's go through some practical examples to illustrate how to implement the new requirements. For this first example, Let's say you have an HVAC unit in zone one that has a filter that needs to be replaced. As I mentioned before, this is a temporary and infrequent task that is more than 15 feet from the roof edge. As long as the employer has a rule prohibiting work closer than 15 feet from the edge, no fall protection is required. This example is for the same activity, but let's consider an HVAC unit in zone two so less than 15 feet, but more than six feet from the protect, unprotected edge. It is still temporary and infrequent, but the employer must establish a warning line around the equipment, at least six feet from the roof edge to the heightened risk from, due to the heightened risk from a fall. The six foot distance is established because OSHA believes that a distance less than six feet, an accidental slip or trip could result in enough momentum to propel a worker over the edge. If this activity took place in zone three, full conventional fall protection would be required. For this next example, let's consider longer work to HVAC units in zone one. The work is still at a distance greater than 15 feet from the edge, but it is no longer temporary. 
It still may be infrequent, but not temporary. In this case, the employer could erect a warning line around the roof access point, the hatch in this example, and the HVAC unit where the work will be performed. The warning line would need to be in place for the duration of the work. Now let's consider the same longer term work in zone two. Because it is not temporary work, we can no longer use a designated area with a warning line in zone two. In this case, the employer would need to provide a warning line system through zone one to access the HVAC unit and full fall protection once the worker gets, workers get to the work area in zone two. In the slide, we show a guardrail around the HVAC unit in zone two. But other forms of fall protection, such as a fall rest or safety net system, could be implemented. In some cases, WJE has been asked by owners of buildings, especially with roofs that have a lot of different equipment and activities that occur on a varying basis, to establish a plan to cover all maintenance-related tasks that may need to be performed. An example is shown here that accommodates a range of activities and provides the required fall protection systems for those activities. In this case, the employer may want to establish a warning line around the zone one area for work that could be long-term. And in locations where there is equipment for, or a need to get to the edge of the roof fairly frequently, a guardrail guard or other means of full fall protection could be installed. So as an employer or building owner, you know that the employees have a reasonable approach to provide full fall protection. Now that I've covered some examples for accessing areas on low slope roofs, I'll get into accessing building facades from rooftops. This portion of the presentation is meant to be an introdu introduction to the methods and equipment used to access facades. Probably the most common usage of facade access equipment in the Pacific Northwest is for window cleaning. Buildings may have the windows cleaned several times a year. Facade access is also required for general facade maintenance, which may include sealant repair or window reglazing. Inspections and minor repairs are also included in facade access work. Occasionally, more in-depth repairs are required and may be deemed construction activities by OSHA. There are different requirements for construction activities than facade access for maintenance purposes. The definition of construction is not well defined in OSHA, but generally speaking, anything beyond minimal maintenance qualifies as construction and triggers additional and in some cases more stringent requirements. Let's now briefly review some common types of equipment. This photo shows a power platform installation, which is sometimes referred to as a building maintenance unit or BMU. It has a roof car or carriage that traverses the roof perimeter, in this case on a track, and raises and lowers a working platform that provides access to the work area on the facade. The platform is suspended by two independent sets of cables, and the workers are permitted to attach their personal fall protection directly to the platform. Another type of powered platform is this modular system, commonly referred to as a swing stage. In this case, the platform and the hoists are furnished by the contractor to access the building on a temporary basis. These systems are usually only supported by a single cable at each end of the platform, and thus the workers are required to have their personal fall protection equipment secured to independent lifelines attached to structurally sound anchorage points on the roof of the building. While the contractor is responsible for inspecting and maintaining their platform and hoists, the building is responsible for providing suitable points to suspend the platform and sufficient anchorage points to secure lifelines and tieback. Davit systems are one way to support platforms. Regardless of whether they are powered or non-powered, contractor provided or building provided. The components shown here include Davit arms, indicated by the pink arrows, which extend up and out over the building edge to provide a suspension point. The arms mate with davit bases indicated by the yellow arrows that are connected to the roof framing and resolve the forces from the platform into the building structure. The platform indicated by the red arrow is raised and lowered by hoist indicated by the green arrows traveling on the suspension cables. Davit systems are often proprietary and there are many different kinds of davit bases. The ones on the previous side were affixed to the roof framing. This davit base is attached to the screen wall framing. 
Davit based systems are typically constructed of galvanized steel components. Davit arms are often made of high strength aluminum alloys to facilitate ease of installation. Non powered equipment such as rope descent systems, also known as RDS, or bosun's chairs, are also fairly commonplace in the Pacific Northwest. In this case, the platform, so to speak, is merely a seat board upon which the worker rests. Roof descent systems require two lines, a descent or working line to support the platform and an independent vertical lifeline that will arrest and suspend a worker in the event of a, of a fall. Rooftop anchorages are required to support independent working lines and lifelines for fall arrest. Equipment and to support equipment tie for certain types of contractor provided equipment. One of the most common types of anchorages are the individual standalone pedestal anchorages shown in this photo, which consist of a ring for securing one line, a post which extends down beneath the roof level to a base plate that is in turn secured to the roof framing. Anchorages come in many varieties, but usually have a half loop that the worker can attach the line to, and then they are anchored to the structure of the building. Note that the most important connection details of the anchorage are concealed by roofing or facade elements. And inspecting these portions requires removal of building components. Horizontal lifelines are sometimes encountered and can be used to connect lifelines, but not working lines. They are complicated systems owing to the fact that the tension generated in the cable can be many times greater than the applied force just like the tension in a clothesline will far exceed the weight of the clothes it supports. Many horizontal lifeline systems are equipped with energy dissipating devices to limit the forces transmitted to the roof structure. Permanently dedicated horizontal lifeline systems must be designed, installed, and used under the supervision of a qualified person. Now that we have had a brief overview of the types of equipment used for facade access, let's dive into the OSHA regulations. There are many regulations that govern facade access. I'm going to focus on the new updates to OSHA that took effect on January 17, 2017. Then we will briefly discuss the other re regulations you may encounter. Here's a roadmap to where some of the relevant OSHA regulations can be found in the Federal Register. OSHA doesn't make it easy to find the requirements. They're scattered throughout multiple sections, so finding the pertinent regulations for your building can seem difficult. The requirements for permanently dedicated powered equipment are found largely in section 1910.66. There are some minor changes to this section, but for the most part, requirements were substantially unchanged. If you have a BMU on your building, this is where your requirements for initial and annual certification and monthly inspections are found. If you have building provided davits or anchorages, Provisions in this section apply to those elements as well. The contractor provided equipment is governed by section 1910.27. For equipment such as swing stages, parapet hooks, and counterweighted outrigger beams, the old section has been completely eliminated and replaced with the new section that now redirects to the construction provisions in section 1926. The requirements have not changed fundamentally, but are not consistent with the requirements for construction activities. The topic that is most frequently questioned by owners, building managers, and contractors is the change to the provisions governing rope descent systems. And they are twofold. One, there is a requirement that acreages for rope descent systems must be inspected, tested, and certified for 5,000 pounds. Originally, the new rule gave employers and building owners until November 20th, 2017 to comply with the requirements for inspecting, testing, and certifying rope descent system anchorages before any worker uses the anchorage. However, due to a limited availability of qualified persons to inspect, test, and certify anchorages, OSHA is providing employers and building owners additional time to comply, provided that employers and building owners can demonstrate and document they are exercising due diligence to come into compliance with the standards requirements. Secondly, the restriction on rope descent systems for use at heights over 300 feet is also a big change. With over 50 buildings in Seattle and 10 in Portland, over 300 feet tall, 
this change may come into play for your building. With more and more high rises being proposed and built, this restriction will need to be considered during the planning stage. There are also new usage and training requirements for rope descent systems, but these apply mostly to contractors and workers and not building owners. Another topic that has come up is industrial rope access. Some of you have probably heard about industrial rope access or IRA. It is very similar to rope descent systems, but there are differences between the two methods in terms of the equipment used and the level of training, with IRA systems being a little more intensive on both counts. For these and other reasons, OSHA distinguishes between IRA and RDS. The regulations about the 300-foot limit and the anchor certification that are applicable to RDS are not applicable to industrial rope access. IRA techniques are particularly Germain on older buildings where providing suspended scaffolding is particularly tricky. IRA techniques may also be more expensive than RDS systems given the additional training involved. As an aside, WJE staff utilize IRA techniques for our difficult access teamwork, which we have used on facade inspections across the country. The photo here shows WJE professionals using IRA techniques several years ago to inspect the exterior of the Washington Monument. With that, I'll hand it off to Yarko to discuss the governing bodies other than OSHA that have standards concerning facade access and walking working surfaces. Thanks, Cal. Uh, thanks again to everyone for attending our webinar. Um, now let's take a brief look at other regulations that can govern facade access uh, beyond OSHA. In addition to OSHA, um, there can be state and local regulations that provide additional requirements for facade access activities. However, they are there to supplement federal requirements and they cannot override OSHA's requ regulations, uh, building codes, or uh, the reference standards. In Washington, the fall protection guidelines are administered by Washington Labor and Industries, LNI, and are found in the Washington Administrative Code. Uh, while in Oregon, worker safety is administered by Oregon OSHA, and the rules uh, and the rules can be found in the Oregon Administrative Rules or the uh, OARs. <clears throat> in general, all of the federal OSHA standards are applicable in Washington, Oregon. Uh, there are some minor modifications, uh, such as Oregon choosing to delay some of the adoption dates, uh, generally by a few months or up to one year, uh, in some cases. In addition, for the most part, the Oregon OSHA seems to lump industrial rope access and rope descent systems into the same category. Um, IRA is still allowed to go over 300 feet in Oregon, um, unlike RDS. This can affect the use of um, selection of anchors um, when performing industrial rope access activities. Um, so that's something to consider. And bottom line is that if you're compliant with federal OSHA, you will be okay in Washington and in Oregon. The model codes that are listed, such as the International Building Code, or IBC, which is in fact here in uh, Washington, Oregon, uh, now contain design requirements for facade access equipment. Uh, these documents also provide requirements for load testing. However, these documents really only pertain to the design professional that you may hire to design access systems or equipment, and they don't necessarily have much authority over the requirements of, of, of the building owner. Uh, another good standard is the NTC 359. It's a state-of-the-art industry series of documents, and it kind of is all things that come to fall protection and how they interface with the SOD access systems. The Z359 family of standards is best known for providing guidance on industrial rope access, uh, which can be used for SOD work in lieu of more conventional methods, as uh, Cal stated earlier. Uh, these standards are valuable resources for fall protection in general, but can also be helpful for facade work, considering that all suspended facade work requires a fall arrest system for the workers. Um, there are two standards that should be looked at with caution. One of them is IWCAI 14.1, and the other is ASME A120.1A. Um, the International Window Washers Association uh, standard IWCA 14.1 window cleaning safety was created with a worthy goal to maintain more safety around window washing activities. 
and um, and then it's a good thing. However, the technical provisions of this document were flawed in many ways, and um, they've kind of had a checkered past um, in the past. So because of their history, their accreditation was withdrawn by ANSI. Um, however, the standard may still be quoted by some vendors. So it's WJE's view that this standard should not be relied upon as there are more technically sound documents that can be used instead. <clears throat> There's also, um, as mentioned previously, another caution involves ASME A120.1 standard. So the same people who developed the IWCA standard were also involved in developing key provisions in the A120.1 standard. Uh, and basically, its provisions on load testing standards are wrong and should not be followed by followed by engineers. Um, we will cover this topic in a little bit more detail later. So, uh, with all these regulations and standards, how does a building owner begin the process towards compliance? Uh, what we have seen to be the most effective ways to start a collaborative discussion with your vendors. Uh, with your architect or engineer and with yourselves about what you have on your building, uh, what you've been doing in the past, and what options you have with compliance with the new regulations. Um, this certainly is in a situation where a one-size approach fits, fits all. Uh, so with that, let's talk about how you can become compliant. So some strategies to work towards to see if you're compliant. So there's some strategies that you can take to work towards to see if you're compliant. Um, also, if you're if you're not compliant, how do you get yourself back into compliance? And if you never had compliance, uh, how do you get there for the first time? Uh, but the question itself, are we compliant, is a little bit daunting. Uh, hopefully by now you've already identified areas where your operations may be affected by new OSHA rules and identifying items that may need to be modified to, to reach the remaining compliance. Um, but how do we tackle this? Uh, there's so many changes, so many topics. Uh, where do we start? Um, first, I'd like to briefly touch on two misconceptions about OSHA compliance and highlight a conceptual framework for addressing safety and risk on our rooftops and facades. Uh, we need to dispense with the notion that OSHA compliance will automatically make you safe. Uh, OSHA compliance just means that you have met the minimum legal requirements. It doesn't address every building or every situation, and it itself res result will not it will not result in a safe safe workplace. A concept viewed throughout safety engineering, and one that is helpful to look at here, is the hierarchy of controls. Uh, in short, hierarchy of controls recognizes that not all compliant protection provides the same level of safety. Every fall protection system or strategy, short of eliminating the hazard, possesses some degree of residual risk. For example, a guardrail, which is a passive fall protection system, doesn't require the work to do anything once it's in place, and therefore it's less defeatable and actually prevents a fall from occurring. An active fall arrest system relies heavily on the worker to properly use the PP equipment and anchorages to be effective. Even if the equipment is used properly, a fall can still occur. If a fall occurs, prompt rescue is required and there's a higher residual risk of injury or even, even if everything goes right and the fall is arrested. Um, remember, OSHA requires prompt rescue to avoid worker suspension trauma. And this can occur when the harness blocks the circulation in the legs of a suspended worker. And also remember that there are a wide range of compliance fall protection options available to you um, to, to a lesser degree with respect to facade access but there are still options available, each with their own trade-offs. <clears throat> so selection of appropriate and compliant facade access or fall protection systems should acknowledge the needs and operations of your organization. Uh, all work at heights possesses some level of remaining risk. The risks are yours. The question is how will you manage them? Um, we also need to get rid of the idea that compliance is equal to good risk management. What we think of our self helpful steps to consider as you're trying to manage your risk is to prioritize your risk management. Uh, to do this, you would first assess your hazards and work tasks to identify your greatest risk. But once you identify the greatest risk, prioritize compliance and safety spending there first. Um, so some of the questions to ask yourself from an operational standpoint are, 
um, what work do we need to do up there and where, how often do we need to do it? What am I willing to pay for compliance? How are aesthetics important on my buildings? Um, how will fall protection affect other building systems? For example, roofing, how will the roof be formed with a bunch of anchors punched through it? And uh, what will permanent dedicated systems cost me operationally in terms of testing, certification, training, maintenance, um, inspection? Um, now with that mindset, try to answer the question, are we compliant? Uh, first things first, focus on the key dates. Uh, rope descent systems have already been banned for descent over 300 feet in length. Uh, this rule came in, in effect about a year ago. Um, we have already passed the May 2017 deadline for training of employees that are exposed to fall hazards and fall arrest systems. Uh, in Oregon, that deadline was pushed back to May 2018. So if you're in Oregon, you still have some time. Um, we have also passed the November 2017 deadline for certification of anchors for rope descent systems. Again, this um, in Oregon was delayed for about a year. Um, in 2018, there's also a deadline coming up for ladders that are over 24 feet. More fundamentally, you need to ask, what do we need to do to change? What do we need to change to be, to be compliant? Um, to make an action plan, first begin by assessing your hazards, operations, and risk. Uh, it's a good idea since OSHA requires assessment anyways in section 1910.132D, uh, which requires that employers assess fall and falling object hazards. Uh, once you've identified non-compliances and hazards and how your work task and operations interface with these hazards, you can prioritize your actions to address areas of greatest risk first. Uh, knowledge is definitely power and on your side in this case. <clears throat> as far as training specifically, section 1910.30 details the requirements for training that was due last May for workers exposed to fall from heights and using personal uh, fall arrest protection systems. OSHA was not specific about what documentation is required, but that training should be documented. Uh, just because you missed a deadline, it's still better to get in compliance now than just to forget about it. Uh, it is important to point out that OSHA is a reactionary enforcement agency, and they are not proactively going around and checking training punch cards, so to speak. Uh, this issue is likely to come up as a violation if something happens at your building or if another citation is issued and training is not documented. <clears throat> at WJE, our professionals are exposed to falls and risk of heights and frequent basis, and all our employees have to go through a fall protection training. Along with site-specific trainings for particular buildings or sites we are working on, uh, we train our own staff through a series of webinars and in-person trainings on fall protection-related issues. And uh, this similar kind of strategy is likely testable and implementable uh, for you as well. Uh, specifically looking at the low slope roof fall protection, I want to remind you that the options that are, that are available, uh, make your selection based on your operational preferences, work task, frequency, duration, and distance that those work tasks are being done from the roof edge. Uh, remind yourself that you have permanent options available but that there can also be temporary solutions that may cover the majority of your tasks. Um, some options to consider can be passive systems like guardrails. Guardrails are good for decades and only need a few coats of paint every once in a while. Um, however, in some instances, your operations may need intensive system, more uh, intense systems such as anchorages. Uh, remember that anchorages will need certification and annual inspections. Uh, guardrails can also be used as temporary solutions. And as Cal mentioned, even warning lines and administrative controls may be acceptable options depending on your situation. <clears throat> For ladders, a simple strategy to address ladders is um, as follows and flows from the implementation dates. The current rules require ladders exceeding 24 feet in length to be fitted with a gauge or a, a, a well or a personal fall arrest system. Uh, if you do not have these systems, then planning on adding these or a um, What's going to happen in uh, 2036 is you're going to have to install a personal fall arrest system instead of a cage or a well. So for permanent fixed ladders, which last for decades, it's best to design new lad replacement ladders to meet the, the future requirements. Uh, looking at rope descent systems and facade access, clearly buildings that are over 300 feet tall need a new solution since rope descent systems are now prohibited. Uh, 
for anchorages and represents that some qualified person must be the one to identify, test, and certify that these things have the 5,000 pound capacity required by OSHA 1910 section 27. Um, as stated earlier, this became a requirement in November of last year. I believe in Oregon, it was uh, January 1st of 2018. Uh, the anchors must also be recertified every 10 years thereafter. There also must be an annual inspection of the anchors by qualified person in between. It is also important to point out that OSHA has insisted that building owners now have some responsibility of the anchorages. Uh, similar to, to other power platforms, the building owners are now responsible for providing a certification to the contractors who need to access their building. In some of the days where worker could select their own anchor for rope descent systems is gone. Uh, the anchors must be pre-selected and certified by a qualified person. Uh, moving on to uh, suspended scaffolds. Uh, if we're thinking of davit systems, uh, these systems have been around for a long time and have been required to be certified and annually inspected for 191066. Um, there has only been minor changes to OSHA 191066, and in general, the changes only modify the references to be consistent with the other sections. Uh, it is important to point out that once these things have been load tested and certified, there is no need to retest the equipment unless it has been damaged or modified. <clears throat> Same thing goes for the tie back that contractors will use for contractor supply suspension equipment, uh, like counterweight swing stages. Uh, keep in mind that anchors uh, for personal fall arrests are not required to be load tested for OSHA 1910.40 if they're only used for that purpose. Um, however, practically speaking, an anchor on roof will very likely be used by rope descent systems or power platform at some point. So it is wise to follow the most stringent provisions governing each class of anchorage unless you have tight control over the equipment and usage at your uh, facility. <clears throat> so now I'd like to dig into some clarifications about testing of facade access equipment and some common pitfalls to avoid when pursuing cert certification testing. Uh, chief among these is uh, some poor practices that are still widely used in the industry that on the surface still bear the certified stamp of approval, but in reality, uh, may significantly undermine the value and accuracy of the testing. Uh, load testing to the full required capacity is logical and likely required by governing structural building codes. Uh, however, both ASME A120.1 and IWCA I14.1 standards both limit test loads to half of the minimum required strength. Uh, reasons provided to justify these requirements are uh, we don't want to damage the roofing or uh, we don't want to damage the equipment. Uh, WJ believes, along with other engineers, that the lives of the workers are more important than potential damage to the roofing. And we would rather have the equipment fail during a controlled load test than when the anchorages or davits are being used to support workers and subject to an emergency loading uh, such as a fall. Um, here's a simple logic test that you don't have to be an engineer to appreciate that demonstrate the dilemma of not testing for the full required loads. <clears throat> um, imagine that you and two of your friends are on a hike in the mountains and come across two bridges. Uh, the bridges cross a deep ravine and there's no, way other, no, no other way across. So your uh, daredevil friends don't care much about engineering and they race across the bridges, each choosing a different bridge and they both make it. Uh, one of your friends weighs 200 pounds and the other 100 pounds. You notice that your heavier friend took the left bridge while the lighter friend took the right bridge. Um, the question is, you weigh 180 pounds. Which bridge would you choose? Uh, you know that the bridge on the left was tested with 200 pounds and it held it, and you know that the bridge on the right was only tested with 100 pounds. Um, which bridge do you, who weighs 180 pounds, walk across? I think we would all choose the bridge that held the weight that is more than our own weight. It just makes common sense. So why would we do anything different when we are testing something that is supposed to have a certain capacity by law? In addition to test loads, we need also need to be mindful of the loading directions. The load tests also need to test the equipment in the directions that it will be loaded in service. Um, testing one way doesn't automatically mean that the assembly is structurally sound for the load in any direction. Uh, it's okay to define restrict directions 
uh, and which equipment may be used based on the test results if testing in multiple directions is not feasible, needed, or cost effective. Um, so this photo is taken a load test that, that does not adequately demonstrate the capacity of the anchorages and the direction of use. Uh, these anchors, the anchor bases are likely to be used with the load acting towards the right-hand side of the page and not towards each other. Um, it is definitely simpler and easier to test two anchorages, anchorages against each other. And this way you accomplish two tests and at one time and you have another anchorage nearby to react off of. Uh, however, the test does not demonstrate the required capacity in the direction of use. For this reason, we would not consider this to be a, be a valid load test. <clears throat> um, while OSHA simply requires testing and certification to be compliant, it is imperative that testing be done in a proper manner as evidenced by numerous test failures observed by WJ over the years. Uh, we don't make this stuff up. There are known instances where equipment has failed and therefore we insist that the load testing be done properly. Uh, how valuable is a letter of certification based on an improper test? Uh, just to flush this out a little bit more, the David arm shown here, we're taking off a building and load tested in our laboratory. And you can see that the arm spent and buckled during our testing at loads that were only about uh, 2,200 pounds. Uh, this is a far cry from the 4,500 pounds that the David arms needed to be able to carry based on the stall rate of the motor that was being used on these arms. Um, we have also seen David base failures that have occurred below the required 5,000 pound load. Um, at this particular building, we were conducting tests and the David bases were failing at loads between 50 to 80% of the 5,000 pound requirement. Uh, the failures were occurring at welds between the data bases and the structural steel frame below, uh, which is located below the roofing. So um, the welds are poor quality, um, and if you could see them, you, would, you could identify that. But since they were below the roof, um, there was no way to visually inspect them. <clears throat> so during our testing, we saw many of the, these data bases uh, or these bases fail between half and full load, a uh, few of the failures even below half load, and some even at service load. Um, interestingly, um, these bases had been tested previously on to half load, and testing agency had flagged some of the bases. However, as you can see from the plan view, approximately half of the anchorages failed when tested to 5,000 pounds in the direction of use. Uh, some of these bases is actually passed in one direction, but then failed in a different direction. Uh, this underscores the need to test the full OSHA required loads. Uh, this also underscores importance of load direction and underscores the need to test each and every installation and or component. Um, so what happens if your anchorage, anchorages or David arms don't pass a test or your certification has lapsed? Do you need to start over? Um, the simple answer is no. A qualified person who objectively works with you to identify the best fall protection of facade access approaches for your facility can provide a lot of ability to design, modify, repair, and recertify systems as needed. Um, OSHA only requires retesting of damaged or modified facade access components. Often repairs of alternative access means are possible. Uh, WJ is willing to fix any deficiencies or failures. We have these capabilities in-house. It is especially helpful if time is of the essence, and we can accelerate the repair process by foregoing the contractor. Um, <clears throat> here are some photos. There's a building in Seattle. We replaced um, a failed component of a horizontal lifeline on a building. Um, the component of the original installation had failed, and the building had a difficulty getting a, the system repaired and the horizontal lifeline we certified. Um, the repair was somewhat complex due to the location of the anchor and the existing configurators, the configuration of the building components, uh, mainly due to the, the granite panels and, and the location on the very top apex of the building. Um, but uh, we were able to develop a solution that restored the integrity of the lifeline and we were able to design, install, and test the new anchor in-house. Uh, in fact, our DAT team will be using this lifeline um, during the ins uh, inspection of the facade coming up in the uh, next few weeks. 
Um, other facade access solutions include turnkey anchorages. By turnkey anchorages, we mean providers that design, fabricate, install, test, certify, and inspect the anchorages and equipment, uh, kind of similar to what we did on this particular building in Seattle. Uh, this is prevalent in the industry and can be a good way to go when you don't already have anchorages available. Uh, however, beware companies that promise to certify anchors but do it in accordance with IWCA or ASME and only test to the half to 5,000 pound load. Uh, beware of equipment solutions that don't meet your operational needs and needs and objectives. And remember the anchorages are often just one option to provide compliance. Uh, WJ also turns, turn, does turnkey solutions in certain situations. And our own Anchorage facade access equipment designs are custom uh, for the client. <clears throat> so there are many ways for, for going forward and, and breaching compliance. Uh, you know your building, your budgets, and have a type of risk and how you would like to manage your risk. Uh, the legal requirements are what they are. However, it is your responsibility to manage your risk. We would just like to strongly encourage that you that you have a qualified person evaluate your options prior to spending several hundred thousand on new anchorages. And with that, uh, we will open it up for some questions. Thank you, Yarko. As a reminder, if you have a question, please just type it into the Q&A box and hit send. And if we don't get to your question during the call today, we will follow up with everyone afterwards. Okay, let's take our first question. Can you please clarify the Anchorage inspection and testing requirements? Sure, Liz, I'll take that one. So the requirements are most stringent for rope descent system anchorages. Um, they're actually the only uh, permanent facade access equipment that requires testing by, by the letter of the law, but we do recommend that all permanently mounted facade access equipment be tested, and it's pretty pretty well accepted policy in the industry. Um, so that would be include davit bases and anchorages that are uh, used for tie back lines or fall arrest lines for contractor provided equipment. So the the requirement for rope descent systems are. Uh, they need to be tested prior to usage to 5,000 pounds in the direction of use. Um, and then the inspection, they need to be annually inspected. This can be visual, and then it's really just for any signs of damage or loss of capacity. And then recertification needs to occur at 10 year intervals, or if damage uh, is observed or, or damage occurs due to a fall. Um, it's not clear yet if the recertification requires retesting, but stay tuned for that. And for Davit systems and anchorages for contractor supplied equipment, um, the testing should occur to a load that depends on the stall load of the hoist. And it also depends on the activity, whether it's maintenance or construction. And then you also need to inspect annually um, in a similar way, and you only need to retest if the system is damaged or modified. There's um, I guess another question here. Um, please expand on RDS window cleaning using I IRA training to bypass the 300 foot rule. Um, so for industrial rope access, the, the employees must go through uh, some sort of a training process and that um, trains them to use some of the specific equipment. So IRA equipment is, is specific to industrial rope access and uh, it's different than from rope descent uh, systems. And IRA has uh, more leniency in, in accordance with OSHA because IRA is actually considered work positioning. and in, and therefore, it's not full arrest. Um, so what we do with uh, WJE, our DAT team, we are all uh, certified by SPRAT, which is Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians, uh, to get our training. Um, and then our equipment is, is in accordance with uh, 
IRATA international rope access technicians as well as SPRAT, and they meet the requirements for industrial rope access as defined by OSHA. I'll answer another question that kind of uh, leads from that one. Um, and it's, can waivers be obtained for the 300 foot per hour rope descent system? And currently there are, there is no, no waiver system. So you either have to go through the IR, IRA uh, requirements or find another means of accessing the facade, whether it be from powered platforms or uh, an ulterior or a, another, another means. And there's another um, a question that I'm not sure, I don't know the an answer to, that the transit rules change um, walking through a fall hazard location. Um, so Cal, do you have any information on that? I don't think they've changed. I am unsure of what the, the original ruling was, but it, it hasn't changed based on the, the, the most recent change. Um, yeah, there hasn't been any change that I'm aware of. Great, we have a, a few additional questions that came in um, via the chat box. One is where would adjusters get training to be able to be compliant or is it even necessary? So for an adjuster to get trained, there really is no requirement. Um, you would want to make sure that you're uh, using the equipment provided by the building. So if there is fall protection, you need to use it. But if there are no anchorage points, you can access whatever you're trying to inspect on a temporary basis for pre and post work. So there isn't really any, any need to, to be trained if you're just doing inspection work. But you definitely need to check with your the building uh, and make sure that if there is facade access equipment or fall protection equipment that you're using it when when it's provided. Okay, here's another one. What is testing equipment for temporary uh, equipment attached to parapets? For example, a swing stage hanging from parapet clamps. So for that, you just need to, so that's actually uh, a contractor or, yeah, I guess contractor provided equipment requirement, and it doesn't fall underneath the new uh, rule changes. Um, so it's really, you just need to make sure that it's tested and certified for the, uh, the use that it's going to be used for but it does not fall underneath the owners or operators or managers provisions that are in the, the most recent rule changes. Okay, we have time for one more question today. It uh, says so the 300 foot rule is specific to the window cleaning industry. Is window cleaning, are window cleaning rules changed if the window cleaning technician is FRAT certified level one, two, or three? Yeah, so the the 300 foot rule is not specific to window cleaning industry. It's specific to rope descent systems. And I understand majority of rope descent systems is for window cleaning, but it could also be used for facade maintenance. Um, and I guess what was the second part of the question was, um, is window cleaning rules changed if, if the technician is SPRAT certified? And so if the technician, if the, if the window cleaning is done using industrial rope access instead of uh, rope descent, then yes, there would be no 300 foot rule. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Cal, and thank you, Yarko. Um, as I said, that is all the time that we have for questions today. If your question wasn't answered, Cal or Yarko will follow up with you afterwards to make sure you get the information that you need. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us and we hope it's been educational. Um, as a reminder, following today's presentation, we will send you a link to a brief survey 
and instructions on how to receive credit for participating in today's webinar. Um, we'll also provide a recording of this webinar that we hope you'll share with any colleagues who you think would benefit from viewing it. And again, we appreciate your time and hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you.